Today I'd like to tell you a story from the life of H.A. Ironside. Harry Ironside was a greatly influential Christian of the previous generation. I didn't know him personally. He went to heaven 12 days after I was born in January of 1951. But uh, he was a great influence on the lives of many of my friends. Uh, Bill and Peter Pell, who were highly influential in my life, they were actually baptized by Harry Ironside. And my grandfather, he just loved yet every one of Harry Ironside's 100 books that he had written. And he would study them with his Bible and he would teach uh, what he learned. And uh, so it was a a great privilege for me to uh, see the influence of a man like this, a man who made it through grammar school. That was it. And yet eventually uh, he was the preacher at Moody Church in Chicago and uh, a man who had a a broad influence across evangelical Christianity around the world. But interestingly, the story I want to tell you is probably the least exciting story in the life of Harry Ironside. He had lots of them, and uh, you can read many of his stories online. But this is the story of his conversion. And I want to tell you this story because I think there are many young people who've grown up in Christian homes who struggle with the same problem. Um, they, they say, well, what does it really mean to believe? I think I've always believed in Jesus, and yet they don't have assurance. And this was Harry's problem. So I, I want to read the story in his own words. It was published in Uplook magazine many years ago. And um, he tells about his father, John, who died when he was two years old, I think, of typhoid in the city of Toronto. And, uh, and yet uh, this man left an impact on Harry's life. He said, um, I've never heard him spoken of other than as a man of God. He was known in Toronto to many as the Eternity Man. His Bible marked in many places was a precious legacy to me. And he tells how um, his mother began to teach him uh, the Word of God. And at the age of four, he distinctly remembers memorizing the words, of Luke 19.10, which says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Harry knew he was lost and that Christ had come from heaven to save him. Now, his, his mother, Sophia, widowed at 26, was a godly woman. And many a time she would kneel with her little boy, and he said she would pray this, O oh, Father, Keep my boy from ever desiring anything greater than to live for thee. Save him early and make him a devoted street preacher as his father was. Make him willing to suffer for Jesus' sake, to gladly endure persecution and rejection by the world that cast out thy son, and keep him from what would dishonor thee. Those words were burned into Harry's mind from the earliest days. He heard them over and over again. Now, these are Harry's own words. He says, To our home there often came servants of Christ, plain, godly men who seemed to me to carry with them the atmosphere of eternity. Yet in a very real sense, they were the bane of my boyhood. They're searching, Henry? Lad, are you born again yet? Or the equally impressive, are you certain that your soul is saved? Often brought me to a standstill. Well, then Harry and his mother moved to California, to the Los Angeles area, eventually up to San Francisco and finally in Oakland. But when they moved to Los Angeles, uh, he realized there was no Sunday school in the neighborhood where they were. And so even though he was only, I think, 11 years of age, he got the neighborhood kids together, they sewed together a tent, and he started having a Sunday school there. And um, <laughs> the tent could hold 100 people, and uh, he would get up and preach. But the fact was that he didn't 
have assurance that he himself was saved. He said, I was nearly 14 years old when, upon returning one day from school, I learned that Donald Monroe, a servant of Christ from Canada, well known to me, had arrived for meetings. I knew before I saw him how he would greet me. For I remembered him well and his searching questions when I was younger. Therefore I was not surprised, but embarrassed nevertheless, when he exclaimed, Well, Harry lad, I'm glad to see you. And are you born again yet? Harry writes, I hung my head and could find no words to reply. My uncle said, You know he preaches himself now a bit and conducts a Sunday school. Indeed, was the answer. Will you get your Bible, Harry? I was glad to get out of the room, and so went at once for my Bible, and returned, after remaining out as long as seemed decent, hoping thereby to recover myself. On my re-entering the room, he said, kindly but seriously, Will you turn to Romans 3.19 and read it aloud? Slowly I read, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. He says, I felt the application and was at a loss for words. The evangelist went on to tell me that he too had once been a religious sinner till God stopped his mouth and then gave him a sight of Christ. He pressed on me the importance of getting to the same place before I tried to teach others. The words had their effect. From that time till I was sure I was saved, I refrained from talking of these things. But now Satan, who was seeking my soul's destruction, suggested to me, if lost and unfit to speak of religious things to others, why not enjoy all the world has to offer? He says, I listened only too eagerly to his words, and for the next six months or thereabout, no one was more anxious for folly than I, though always with a smarting conscience. At last on a Thursday evening in February of 1890, God spoke to me in tremendous power while out at a party with a lot of other young people, mostly older than myself, intent only on an evening's amusement. Standing alone by a refreshment table, there came home to my soul in startling clearness some verses of scripture I had learned months before, found in Proverbs 1, verses 24 to 32. Now, the article doesn't quote those verses, but I've got to read them to you. Imagine this now. Here he is at a party, standing by the refreshment table, when all of a sudden the Spirit of God takes these verses and drives them home to his heart. God is speaking in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded, because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you. Then you will call on me and I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, They shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Wow. Harry goes on to say, Here wisdom is represented as laughing at the calamity of the one who refused to heed instruction and mocking when his fear comes. 
He says, every word seemed to burn its way into my heart. I saw as never before my dreadful guilt in having so long refused to trust Christ for myself and in having preferred my own willful way to that of the one who died for me. He said he just he couldn't enjoy the evening anymore, and uh, he headed home. He said, that night I hurried home, crept upstairs to my room. After lighting a lamp, I took my Bible, and with it before me, fell on my knees. I had an undefined feeling that I'd better pray. But the thought came, what shall I pray for? Clearly and distinctly came back the answer, for what God has been offering me for years. Why not receive it and thank him? He says, my dear mother had often said, the place to begin with God is at Romans 3 or John 3. To both these scriptures I turned and read them carefully, Clearly I saw that I was a helpless sinner, but that for me Christ had died and that salvation was offered freely to all who trusted in him. Reading John 3.16 the second time, I said, That will do. O God, I thank thee that thou hast loved me and given thy Son for me. I trust him now as my Savior, and I rest on thy word, which tells me, I have everlasting life. And then he says this, I expected to feel a thrill of joy. It did not come. I wondered if I could be mistaken. I expected a sudden rush of love for Christ. But it didn't come either. I feared I could not be really saved with so little emotion. I read the words again. There could be no mistake. God loved the world, of which I formed a part. God gave his Son to save all believers. I believed in him as my Savior. Therefore, I must have everlasting life. Again I thanked him and rose from my knees to begin the walk of faith. God could not lie. I knew I must be saved. You know, there are many people who are are just so uncertain about their own position because while they may believe information they've heard about the Lord Jesus, there's never been a time in their life when they personally received him. And when they do, he doesn't promise that you'll feel him come in or see him come in or hear him come in. He simply says, I will come in. And we just rest on his word. Now, from this point on, Harry Ironside has thrilling stories to tell. Amazing stories of God's working. But this story, the first and therefore the pivotal one, there's nothing very spectacular about it at all. Of course, it is spectacular. He moved from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God's son, from being an enemy to to being a child of God. Nothing could be more amazing than when a person gets saved. But as far as his feelings and the outward expression of it, it was just a very simple act of faith. A child believing what God says and receiving eternal life and thanking God for it. And maybe there are some of you, and maybe you're well on in years, but as a little child, you you still have that uncertainty, like, I, I don't exactly know where I am with God. It just comes down to this. God said it. I believe it. I rest where God rests in Christ's finished work. He died for me. I accept him as my Savior. And on that basis, that's all I have. That's all anybody needs to have. We just take God at his word. God said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 